Good morning, everybody. How's 8.30? Yeah. We're on a live. Good morning, Brackpan. I feel like there's Brackpan in the house this morning. Yeah. You see, Brackpan comes early. Good morning, Edenvale. We're streaming live from Boxburg to Edenvale this morning. So, Boxburg, say hello to the Vale. Good morning. Good morning. Good to be with you, Edenvale. And uh, isn't it great that we can use technology to, uh, to help us to do things? in this day and age. So welcome to it this morning. If you're a guest with us, I want to echo Pastor Ken's welcome and say welcome. We're so glad you're here. We are in a series this year, a theme, a vision, uh, a picture this year for our lives. We've called it Good News People. We are good news people, people that are hearing the good news, living the good news, and sharing the good news. Can I take a moment and just talk to us as a family before we dive into it this morning? Is that okay? Talking about good news people, you know, I was thinking one way that we can be good news people to each other is by uh, respecting the space and helping this space in our auditorium on Sunday mornings to be a sacred space. Uh, and by that, I mean a space that's free of distraction. And so I'm going to ask you if you need a wee during the service, and if you can at all knape, knape, try and avoid getting up so that you don't become a good news person who pushes your bum past somebody else while they're busy worshiping, and Jesus is just breaking through to their lives. Their eternal salvation is on the line, but your bum interrupts that. <laughs> yes? Is that okay? Um, the other way we can be good news people to each other is if you're a parent, just, just to uh, help, I think, everybody by, by coming at least 10 minutes before the start of the service. Um, that'll help us in Edenville and in Boxburg. Uh, what that means is then our, our Kids Zone registration team can receive your kids well. We can love them well. We don't get them chucked at the team because you're now in such a rush at song two that's happening and now you're trying to get into the auditorium. Um, it'll mean that they are settled. They have a better experience. It'll mean that the ser team can serve you with excellence and it'll mean that each one of us get the benefit of the entire worship uh, set and that we worship Jesus with integrity. And we're not those muhus that are rock up at 10 past the service time, but that we actually get here on time and help everybody else in the auditorium to experience that together. And everybody who was on time for church most of the time said a big amen. 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 <laughs> Edenvale Boxer, can I invite you to stand with me for a moment? We're going to talk about one of the vices. Last week we spoke about anger. And you may remember I gave you an acronym, A-N-G-R-Y. A stands for let our anger be activated by the right thing. N stands for let it, give it a necessary focus. G, give yourself time and gain control of yourself. R is what? I've forgotten, I'm asking you. <laughs> the right direction and the right time. And Y, let it yield a result can catch that message on YouTube if uh, you want to share it to somebody. And if uh, it's somebody that knows that you're an angry person, share it in and just say that uh, I am learning about this myself. So that, uh, you know, let's pray. Today we're going to talk about fear. Father, in these moments, as Pastor Ken started by just setting the scene for us today, we, we do pray. The reason we pray is because there's power in our prayer. And there's power in our declaration there's power in us receiving the Word. There's power in what the Word does for us. There's power in being commun in community together. There's power in the faith of the person next to us. This morning as we receive your Word, and as we've already verbalized the desire to find freedom, those of us who need it, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come and you would work so deeply in our hearts today to bring freedom that we would walk out of this place. God, seriously, this is our prayer, this is our desire. Across both campuses this morning and online, our prayer is that, Holy Spirit, you would fundamentally free us from fear. As I know, we know you can do. Let your word be activated in our lives today. And let us become doers of your word people who receive your word and let it activate something in our lives. Those of us who may be struggling with uh, a fear and anxiety, a pervading sense of, I wonder if everything's going to be okay, would you just stretch your hands out in front of you? 
this morning and say, Holy Spirit, speak to me. Holy Spirit, work with me. Holy Spirit, work within me. Let your kingdom come and your will be done. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Thanks, everybody. Please be seated. How many of you know that we do all have fear of, of some things at some times, don't we? Um, I'll never forget when I was still in the financial services area, there was a, a lady that I worked with. Her name was Linda. Linda was the most incredible, wonderful, gracious human being, the kindest lady you could ever hope to meet. She wouldn't have harmed a fly, but Linda had a phobia of flying. And she took on a national job, which meant that she had to join me at certain times in heading around the country. And so one such time, we started a road trip together. And I'll never forget sitting on the plane next to her uh, as she hadn't flown in 15 years. This was her, get this everybody, this was her first flight in 15 years, and I was the lucky sucker sitting next to her. <laughs> as the plane began to move and to get ready for the taxi, uh, she went into a trance-like state. I think she was practicing breathing exercises. I think she was, she was doing all sorts of things that people had told her to do in order to cope with the flight. But the one thing that she hadn't planned on and the one thing that I certainly hadn't planned on was her hand moved over from her lap to my leg and she caught my leg in a grip like an iron vice. She didn't even know she was doing it. So now I sit with a dilemma, what do I do? Do I, do I break her trance and tell her, hey, Linda, you're grabbing my leg and it's kind of inappropriate? Or do I let the poor woman just use her crutch for the moment? Anyway, I, I let it go and uh, my, my leg remained in its iron grip until the plane was up and about 15 minutes in and she exited from her state and, and suddenly she noticed her hand. She said, I'm so sorry. Has my hand been there all that time? I said, yes, it has. <laughs> She had a fear of flying. We all have fears of something, don't we? Today we're going to learn, we're going to learn, we're going to start to learn, we're going to start to learn how to overcome the vice of fear that can so easily grip us. We all live with fear in some measure. There are two types of fear. There's natural fear, which would be fear, for example, of a loud noise. If we had to have an explosion take place next to us, every single one of us would get a fright in that moment and we'd feel somewhat fearful. That's natural fear. Or if I drove too close to a cliff, for example, and there was a passenger in the passenger seat uh, who was looking at the cliff and looking at the sheer drop, uh, you and I both know that there would be fear involved. Hey, that's what we can call natural fear, isn't it? But then... And, and we all have natural fear, and that's normal, and that's natural. That's part of our self-preservation. But each one of us are also uh, have to deal with and are uh, attacked by something that's not natural, and that's the spirit of fear. And it's the spirit of fear today that I want to speak to us about and help us learn to overcome. Because every single one of us have two types of fear, natural fear and a spirit of fear, and it's not the natural fear that wreaks havoc in our lives, it's the spirit of fear that wreaks havoc in our lives. And, it, and, and you may be wondering about my terminology, and you may be wondering why I've called it a spirit of fear. I call it a spirit of fear because the Scripture actually calls it a spirit of fear. Come with me to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God has not given us what? A spirit of fear. Meaning that there is a spirit of fear. Paul, who was writing this to Timothy, was writing to say to him, Timothy, that spirit of fear that's in your life, that spirit of fear that you are dealing with, that spirit of fear which rears its head all the time, I didn't give it to you. God didn't give it to you. But yet you're dealing with it. Yet it's real. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of fear. Oh, and timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. When I talk about a spirit, let's just be clear what I'm talking about. A spirit is nothing other than an unbodily personal power. In other words, it's a power, it's a force, it's just not in a physical body, but it's as real as if you and I were in a physical body. Are you with me? 
And make no mistake, Paul writes in Ephesians, another letter to the New Testament churches, and he says, put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand against all the strategies of the devil, for we are not fighting against what? Flesh and blood. What did I just say a spirit is? A spirit is an unbodily personal power. It's a personal force, and it exists. It's as real as if it was in a body, but it doesn't have a body. And Paul confirms that you and I wrestle against such things like this. He says, we are not fighting against flesh and blood, but against against evil rulers, authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against what? Evil spirits. And Paul writes to Timothy, this is so important for every single one of us who's a Christ follower. Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, you have sincere faith. You have amazing faith. Your faith is earnest and sincere. Timothy, you are my protege. You're my disciple. You're the one who's learning from me. Timothy, you're my leadership succession plan. Timothy, you're going to be an apostle to the churches. Timothy, you're a great pastor. But Timothy, you're also struggling with the spirit of fear. It's possible for you and I as followers of Jesus to have an earnest, sincere faith and yet still be struggling with a spirit of fear. Are you with me? Why? Because this side of heaven, church, as we live in a fallen world, we don't live in paradise. We don't live in utopia. We live in a realm, Paul wrote, that's why I read you Ephesians 6, we live in a realm where the devil does have strategies and he does have a measure of power and he does have forces and rulers and spirits uh, that live in the same space that you and I occupy. So this atmosphere around us does have an evil spirit within it. It does have evil spirits within it. Are you with me? And fear is one of those that attacks Christ followers. And it, just because you may be dealing with the spirit of fear does not mean that you don't have faith. Doesn't mean that your faith is not real. Doesn't mean that your faith is not sincere. Timothy, as I said, was a great pastor. He was going to be an apostle. He was going to be Paul's leadership succession plan. Timothy was a great follower of Jesus, but he also had a spirit of fear. Are you all okay? And fear has one goal. And that is to put us in a straitjacket. And I, I think one of the most pervading things within our South African culture at the moment is that the enemy uses fear to neutralize the church, to keep the church uh, limited, to keep Christ followers limited. The, the enemy strategy is to keep you and I as followers of Jesus in a straitjacket, constricted, uh, uh, small, um, wrapped up. Picture me with a straitjacket on right now, not able to move around, not able to do what I was designed to do. And, and think about this. Any time you and I operate from a place of fear, it will always be constricting. It always diminishes. It always holds back. What's the objective of the spirit of fear, church? It is to hold you and I back from what God wants us to do in this world. How do you know if you're being affected by a spirit of fear? There'll be some statements on the screen. Uh, number one is, let me just get to it, uh, is that it will occupy your mind frequently, fear. If you find yourself with fearful thoughts often, it's just the spirit of fear that's trying to have a go at you. If fear plays a big role in the decisions you make, if you find yourself making a lot of decisions and the root of those decisions are fear, if you find yourself struggling to move forward in life, struggling to take a well-calculated risk, struggling to, to, to take ground, struggling to take steps of faith, if you find yourself being constricted and held back and, and diminished and constrained, you can know you might be struggling with the spirit of fear. And if fear is negatively affecting your life, if it's affecting the quality of your life, if it's affecting your sleep, if it's affecting the decisions you make, if it's affecting your relationships, if it's affecting your faith life, then you know there might be something for you to deal with today. There'll be a statement on the screen. Fear can limit our effectiveness and lessen our lives. Recap, natural fear, spirit of fear. It's not the natural fear that we have to worry about. It's the spirit of fear that we have to deal with. Spirits of fear are real. Why? Because we live in a fallen world. Because the devil has a measure of power in this world. How does he attack you and I as Christ followers? He attacks us through spirits. One of them that's pervading a lot in our culture at the moment is the spirit of fear. Particularly in the younger generation, the devil's wreaking havoc with a spirit of fear. 
What is the objective of a spirit of fear? It's to hold you back. It's to lessen you. It's to diminish your life. It's to reduce your effectiveness. It's to make you less than what you are. It's to hold you back from what God might have for you. Today I'm going to offer from a text a few thoughts on how you and I can begin to overcome the spirit of fear. I'm going to read us a fairly lengthy passage of Scripture. I'm going to ask that you try and track with me as best as you can. Those of you with ADD, just, you know, twiddle your thumbs while you read or do something. But the passage is worth reading. It is a fascinating account in the Old Testament of King Jehoshaphat, who is the fourth king of Judah. Uh, He was ruling at the same time that Ahab and Jezebel were ruling uh, the northern kingdom of Israel, sorry, the southern kingdom of Israel, and he was ruling Judah. He was, by and large, a good king. He had made some strategic blunders. But here he faces three key armies, the Moabites, the Edomites, and the Ammonites. These armies have banded together to come and to take his nation effectively. This is where we pick up the account. Second Chronicles chapter 20. It says, after this, the armies of the Moabites, Ammonites, and some of the Munites declared war on Jehoshaphat. Messengers came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army from Edom is marching against you from the Dead Sea. They are already at Hazazon Tamar. Jehoshaphat was terrified by this news. How many of you know there was fear involved? And he begged the Lord for guidance. He also ordered everyone in Judah to begin fasting. And so people from all towns of Judah came to Jerusalem to seek the Lord's help. Jehoshaphat stood before the community of Judah and Jerusalem in front of the new courtyard at the temple of the Lord. He prayed, O Lord, God of our ancestors, you alone are the God who is in heaven. You are ruler of all the kingdoms of the earth. You are mighty and powerful. No one can stand against you. Oh, our God, did you not drive out those who lived in this land before your people Israel arrived? And did you not give this land forever to the descendants of your friend Abraham? Your people settled here, built this temple to honor your name. They said, whenever we are faced with any calamity, such as war, plague, or famine, we can come to stand in your presence before this temple where your name is honored. Isn't it amazing there that we see the people of God coming to the temple of God anytime they faced hardship? Can I suggest to you, church, that anytime you and I face a hardship, anytime you and I face an uphill battle, the place to be is in the presence of God with the people of God. Are you with me? Not, not to run, but to be in that place. We can cry out to you to save us, and you will hear us and rescue us. You know, I love that congregational prayer that Pastor Ken led led us in today. You may think, oh, nothing happened in that moment. Listen, you are declaring faith with your lips. They cried out to God to save us. We cried out to God to save us. God honors the man and woman who stands in his presence, in his church, with his people, and verbalizes with their mouths something of faith. And he goes on and he says, and now see what the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir are doing. You would not let our ancestors invade those nations when Israel left Egypt. So they went around them and did not destroy them. Now see how they reward us. For they have come to throw us out of your land, which you gave us as an inheritance. Oh, our God, won't you stop them? We are powerless against this mighty army that's about to attack us. We do not know what to do, but we are looking to you for help. As all the men of Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, wives, and children, the Spirit of the Lord came upon one of the men standing there. How many of you know that the way to tackle the spirit of fear is with the Spirit of the Lord? His name was Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, son of Benaiah, son of Jael, son of Mataniah, a Levite who was a descendant of Asaph. And he said, listen, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem, listen, King Jehoshaphat, this is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid. Don't be discouraged by this mighty army, for the battle is not yours, it's God's. Tomorrow, march out against them. You will find them coming up through the ascent of Ziz at the end of the valley that opens into the wilderness of Jeruel. But you will not even need to fight. Take your positions. So important that we take a position, and then we stand still and watch the Lord's victory. He's with you, O people of Jerusalem and Judah. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Go out against them tomorrow, for the Lord is with 
you. Oh man, there's so much here. I hope you're getting some notes. I hope you've made a book note of this. I hope you highlight this in your Bible. And early the next morning, the army of Judah went out into the wilderness of Tekoa, and on the way, Jehoshaphat stopped and said, listen to me, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem, believe in the Lord your God, and you will be able to stand firm. Believe in his prophets, and you will succeed. And after consulting the people, the king appointed singers to walk ahead of the army, singing to the Lord and praising him for his holy splendor. This is what they sang, give thanks to the Lord, his faithful love endures forever. The very moment they began to sing and give praise, the Lord caused the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir to start fighting amongst themselves. The armies of Moab and Ammon turned against their allies from Mount Seir and killed every one of them. With friends like that, who needs enemies? (laughs) After they had attacked the army of Seir, they began attacking each other. So when the army of Judah arrived at the lookout point in the wilderness, all they saw were dead bodies lying on the ground as far as they could see. Not a single one of the enemy had escaped. And then down to verse 30, and this is where we close. So Jehoshaphat's kingdom was at peace, for his God had given him rest on every side. I want to offer us today five things that I think from this text, five things directly from the text that I think help us to overcome fear. Five principles from this text that if you and I will hear them today, but not simply hear them, if you and I will adopt them, Edenville, if you and I will just hear them, and adopt them, begin to assimilate them, begin to take them on into our lives. Not not listen to this as a sermon, go, that's very nice, go home and put your notes in your shelf or keep them on your phone and never refer to them again. But if you and I would begin to integrate these and weave these into our lives, you and I will find, I'll make this prediction, you will find that fear will begin to dissipate, fear will begin to diminish, fear will begin to take a less of a role in your life. First thing that happened is prayer and fasting. Verses three and four. He also ordered everyone in Judah to begin fasting. So people from all the towns of Judah came to seek the Lord's help. That's prayer and fasting. What do you do when you're afraid about something? Take it to the Lord in prayer. How do you show the Lord your intent with prayer by fasting? We can fast food, we can fast social media, we can fast coffee, we can fast Netflix. We can fast, I don't know, you want to fast your spouse, you can fast your, <laughs> you can fast work, I don't know. <laughs> There's something incredibly powerful about fasting. Fasting says to God, I am serious about this. If something's making you fear, fearful, if there's a an atmosphere of fear over your life. If, as I said, you find yourself being dominated by fearful thoughts, if you find your decisions being affected and being directed by fear, if you find that it's affecting your quality of life, can I suggest to you that you take some days of prayer and fasting. That might look like uh, some extra time in the morning and the evenings to pray. Might mean like, look like missing a meal, two meals, three meals a day. Might look like doing an extended fast of vegetables only, uh, like a Daniel fast. Might, might, might look like whatever it is that you're gonna fast. But I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, church, when we get to prayer and fasting, it moves God's hand. Do you see how God's hand was activated by the prayer and fasting? Sometimes we're so serious about things, but we never show God we're serious. Second thing, second principle, was that Israel were encouraged to remember the promises of God. Come with me to verse seven. Oh, our God, check it out, Jehoshaphat. Did you not drive out those who lived in our land? And did you not give this land forever to the, to your, the descendants of your friend Abraham? Jehoshaphat in this moment is reminding Israel of the plan, of the purpose, and of the promises. If you're taking notes this morning, it's good to remember the plan, the purpose, and the promises of God for His people. Get, get a hold of your scripture and read the text back to God. For example, Isaiah 26 verse 3, memorize it. You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. Man, something happens to our spirit. Listen, uh, every time you and I memorize scripture, I'm convinced that the spirit of fear gets weakened. Why? Because the spirit of God within us helps us to memorize that which we need to know. And that which we need to know is now in our spirit. 
That's the power of memorizing scripture. It becomes part of your spirit. There's only so much space in your spirit, and the more space is occupied by scripture, the less it can be occupied by fear. You with me? Third principle, humility. I love this. Verse 12, we have no clue. The, this is the East End 21st century version. We have no clue what to do, but our eyes are on you. Here's the, you can even make a little rhyme of it. Humility, what, what, what's he doing? He's situating himself correctly. I think sometimes we overestimate our own power and we underestimate God's role and God's power in our lives. We do not know what to do sometimes. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna memorize scripture. We're gonna pray and we're gonna fast, but we're gonna declare God our eyes are on you because at, at the end of the day, it's you that sorts things out, not us. You with me? Not that we're passive. And it's not that we're passive recipients of life. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying we, we do what we need to do, but at the end of the day, the battle is not ours. I hope you're being helped this morning. Edenvale, I hope you're tracking with this morning, and I hope it's helping you. Verse 12, we do not know what to do. That is such a beautiful verse to remember, to memorize, to let it become part of our spirit. What are we doing? We're forming humility in ourselves. There. You know, humility is not thinking of ourselves as less than, it's just thinking less it's thinking, not thinking less of ourselves, it's just thinking of ourselves less. Putting less weight on our own ability and more weight on his ability. Fourth principle is listening to voices of faith. Verse 14, spirit of the Lord comes upon this guy. His name is Jehaziel. And, and the spirit of the Lord comes upon one of the men standing there and he begins to speak to the people. What happens? The whole atmosphere begins to change. You know that the atmosphere of our lives changes when we're in the presence of people of faith. That's why the church is not a destination. As Pastor Ken said, it might be a building, but man, that's not the church. The church is the people. The church is the people in the building. Why? Because your faith and my faith rub up against each other every time we gather together. And I never leave this place less full of faith. I always leave, leave with more faith in my life. Why? Because your faith rubs off on me. My faith rubs off on you. Which voices are you allowing to speak into your life? Is it the voice of the oak at, on this, at the Saturday night briar who's just been on his WhatsApp group and he's, he's heard impending doom uh, uh, around whatever situation is going on? Or are you listening to the voices of faith that you need to, your life group leader, your team leader, your pastor, people that are good, faithful friends in your life that love you, that want the best for you, that want to speak life into you? You're listening to the voice of News 24, or the news of Carte Blanche, or the news of Eyewitness News. Listen, I, I listen to the news, and, and 30 seconds in, I'm like, I, I didn't even need to know this. Are you with me? This is part of what it means to take every thought captive. It's to decide what we let in and what we don't. Can I get some amens in this Presbyterian church? Some of you are News 24 fans, clearly. <laughs> Fifth principle is worship. Verse 18, King Jehoshaphat bowed low with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem did the same, worshiping the Lord. Worship is something we do here on a Sunday morning, and worship is a whole body experience. Worship is with our hands, it's with our voices, it's with our minds, it's with our hearts, it's, it can even be with your feet, some of you, right? But worship is more than on Sunday. Worship's more than Wednesday at life group or Thursday, whenever you have your life group. Worship can be a lifestyle. Worship can be in the bathroom when you're showering. It can be in the car as you drive to work. Worship can be in those first few moments as you wake up and instead of reaching for your phone, imagine a different vision for your life. Instead of reaching for your phone, you just take a few moments and you say, thank you God that I'm breathing yet another day. Thank you God for the night's sleep. Thank you for the food in my stomach. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for, you, say, you know what I mean? It's, a, it's like an essence. Worship's something we engage in all the time. 
Yeah, Pastor Kane always laughs at me because I, if if, I, I, I see beauty in lots of stuff. You know, this morning I looked at the color of the blue sky. I'm like, that blue sky is so lacquer. You know, in England, this would be summer for these people. <laughs> can see beauty in the color of, this, of the trees, the change of the seasons. We can work. There are cues to worship God all around us. Worship is a lifestyle. It's not some formality. Martin Luther King said this, we must build dikes of courage to hold back the flood of fear. And I think what I'm trying to do today is offer us five bricks that can start to build the dike of courage. Can I recap quickly for us? Five things from that scripture. Number one, prayer and fasting. If you find, let me say this again, if you find your decisions, such a burden for this from weeks back, if you find your decisions being held back because you think fearfully first, the spirit of fear needs to be put in its place in your life. If you find your quality of your life is the quality of your sleep, just feel especially for Edenvale and Boxburg, both this, they, there are folks in the building today, your sleep is getting impacted because of fear. As mine was years ago, I would wake up early in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, with my heart beating out of my chest. Just a pervading sense of fear. If, if that's you, then it means fear needs to be dealt with in your life. How are we gonna build the dikes of courage? Remember five things, prayer and fasting, start prayer and fasting. Somebody here in this place today needs to get serious with God, needs to go on a fast to start to, to, start to deal with fear in their lives. I'm, I'm just giving you keys. You, you're going to have to do this yourselves. So prayer and fasting, right? Two, remembering the promises of God, memorizing of scripture. Three, let's right size ourselves. Humility, humility, humility. We do not know what to do, God, but our eyes are on listening to voices of faith. So important to be in communities of faith. So important to be in a life group. Listen, life groups are starting up the 24th of April again. If you're not in a community of faith, if you don't have any Christian voices around you, can I suggest the best thing for you to do would be to get into a, a voice of faith group. And lastly, worship. Which is exactly what we're gonna do in this moment. Can I ask you to stand in our Eden Bell campus and in our Boxburg campus? I heard a fantastic guy's story last week in our Eden Bell campus. I love this. I want to I want to speak courage over you this morning. He says to me, listen, yeah, I just started a new business a month ago. He's doing he's doing uh, custom refurbishments of cars. And while he does the body work of the car, he also puts in sound. He pimps the sound like you can't believe. So you give him your car and it comes back looking incredible. What a business to have on the East Rand. I mean, who? uh, His head office is in Brackpan, as we would expect. It's not really. I'm just that. That was just a bit of artistic life. But he said to me, you know what? He said, I woke up in the morning and God said to me, start this business, it's time to stop being scared of it. And so he started the business. He took half of his garage and he just cleared it out. Then he started a social media drive and he just started to get customers. Why? Because he decided to not let fear hold him back. So as we worship this morning, and that's what we're gonna do, I'm gonna ask you to talk to God. I'm gonna ask you to give him fear. I'm gonna ask him to give you the courage and the the fortitude, the strength, the determination to put this sermon into practice, to not be hearers of God's word, but to be doers, to begin even this afternoon to write down what it is that you took from today, what it is that God's speaking to you about. Maybe today you've got to go on a fast and you know you've got to start a fast and it's only the power of a fast that's going to break the spiritual thing over your life. Maybe today uh, you know you need scripture all over you. Maybe today it's you're going to delete some apps off of your phone. 
Maybe you're going to make an intentional decision to distance yourself from some voices of fear. Maybe today it's, you realize, you know what, I've been trying to play God in my life and I haven't given God any space. I haven't given Him up. And, and you're just going to memorize that verse. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Are you with me? And maybe today you're going to just decide to worship God at a whole new level. Listen, maybe... Maybe you're an introvert. Today, you can make a decision that your, your worship's going to be extroverted. Maybe you've never raised your hands before you're going to do it. Maybe you never sing. Today, you're going to sing. I don't know what it is, but I, I know that if you will worship God in increasing measures of authenticity and sincerity, and, and, and if you will bring the sacrifice of praise, worship can begin to drive out that fear. So, eat Bell Boxberg. Let me ask you, are you ready to worship Him this morning? Are you ready to give God some praise? Are you ready?